Thank you so much all for, for joining. Uh, today we're going to, to just have a couple slides here talking about some of the national security challenges for microelectronics. So the uh, topics we hope to cover today are uh, regarding the importance of microelectronics, some of the recommended areas of focus within the microelectronics sector that we think have, have really not been talked about as much, uh, and then how the government can address gaps that we see as we've analyzed these sectors, and then finally a summary of conclusions. So really, uh, the term microelectronics or semiconductors or integrated circuits, those are used interchangeably. Technically, an integrated circuit are semiconductors that contain one or more transistor, while the term semiconductor itself refers to materials that have unique electrical, magnetic, and optical properties. Microelectronics are small electronic components built on semiconductor materials that have multiple transistors connected to form integrated circuits. So if you really look at microelectronics, you see that they are the underpinning for almost every single technology revolution that you can think of, from radios to computers, to mobile phones, displays, AR, VR headsets, wearables, hearables, autonomous systems, hypersonic missiles, and everything else that's important within our country's Department of Defense. So if we look at the microelectronics, um, kind of how a microelectronics actually made, just like anything else, it starts with coming up with an idea, designing the product, sending that design or blueprint over to a place to manufacture it, which is called a foundry, and actually making the product, packaging it up and sending it back. Today, most of the designing is done in the US, so we really, own quite a large share in terms of the actual design and IP created of fabulous semiconductor chips. But almost all of those designs themselves, almost all the blueprints are actually sent over to Asia, to either Taiwan for TSMC or Korea for Samsung. So that's really what's happened. This change has really happened over the last 20 years. The significant change in the ship shipment of uh, chip manu shift, excuse me, of chip manufacturing or foundries or fabrication to Asia, and this happened because of relative labor costs, differing environmental sensitivities, and government's willingness to help fund the large capital investment needed so the Korean and Taiwanese could have these merchant fabrication facilities. Now, people may say, "Hey, well, there's Intel." Now, Intel does have a foundry. However, the majority of their production is used for their own chips. We know anecdotally, even from Intel Capital, and actually almost every single one of the startups in which they've invested in, do not manufacture within Intel's own foundry. They manufacture it at TSMC. So really, the majority of the, of the startups we see, if not all, um, are all fabulous and really um, have to, to rely on TSMC most of the time um, or other facilities in Asia for them to actually get their chips manufactured. So this slide really talks about how we look at the semiconductor um, industry itself. So on the left here is, is a kind of the InQtel microelectronics stack. If I just go through these briefly, at the bottom you have the foundries, tools, and materials, as I mentioned, um, those are used to make, you know, if you, akin to making a house, right? It, it, those are used to make memory, which might be like the storage or the closets in the house, um, or and then circuit blocks, which might be akin to the wiring, et cetera, in the house that you can put together to make processors, which might be a specific room in a house, and then further put those things together uh -huh to make a custom ASIC, which might be the house itself. Um, and then the packet, you know, packaging so that you can eventually put this into a larger product and ship off. Now, the areas we really think, uh, you know, that haven't really been covered uh, that are, are the tools, the materials and packaging, which we'll cover here. So I'm gonna start with the tools. So the tools themselves, as I mentioned, you know, most of those designs are sent off to Asia and they're fabricated there. Now, unlike a house where you could just use a hammer and nail, 
the tools are really very, very specific to this industry, and they're really the choke point of any foundry's ability to fabricate a leading edge node. So what I mean by leading edge is for microelectronics to get better and better, you probably are all familiar with Moore's law, the transistor needs to get smaller and smaller. And the only way you can do that is you need to pattern it with very fine tooling. Um, in this case, it's a company uh, called, called ASML. So today, there's this, the industry for semiconductor duals is highly concentrated. The good news is that three of the five top five um, providers are domestic. Kind of the bad news is the only company that can make this specialized tool to make those transistors really, really small is ASML, and that's based in Holland. Now, what's going on from a national strategy point of view? Of course, the US is dominant here, um, but China is absolutely trying to cut into our lead. They're trying to become independent of our tool vendors and have tried to uh, invest in startups that can be directly with the tool vendors themselves. If we look at our venture capital activity versus theirs in this space, you will find a lot more startups that they're backing here, whereas in the US, um, you know, there's only been about five investors that, that keep wanting to invest anywhere in this space. Um, from our point of view, what the US needs to do is really work with the European suppliers like ASML and then continue to support homegrown capability that can help maintain our leadership position in this space. If we go to the next slide, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Yan, to go over some of the other two areas, the first being materials. Yeah? Thanks, Danny. Danny. So most of the discussions so far around um, that Eileen discussed around tools and these advanced boundaries are focused on making these you know, the smallest, tiniest features at the leading edge node. Uh, but making chips at a leading edge is, is very difficult uh, and is only getting harder. In fact, this complexity translates to longer lead times, lower yields, uh, which all means higher cost. Uh, the reality, though, is that not all parts of a chip need to be made at the leading edge. In fact, not all parts of a chip needs to be even of the same material. And we'll get back to what those materials a little later. So imagine if we can make a chip as easily as putting together Lego blocks. You know, by selecting the most appropriate a component, or what we call a chiplet, snapping them together, or even stacking them on top of each other. Now, this technique is called advanced packaging, and, and we think it has profound national security implications and should be thoroughly explored um, for to see how, what it can do for uh, for the nation. And, and here's some reasons why. So, one, uh, because the whole chip doesn't have to be made in one foundry, designers can then mix and match chiplets. For example, one can potentially make a unique chip that has commercial state-of-the-art chiplets from one foundry, such as TSMC, and placed next to chiplets made from secure, trusted U.S. facilities, giving us a blend of you know, the best of both worlds and a secure a chip that operates at the, at the best of performance. And two, the U.S. has a number of secure, trusted facilities, but they're all of older or legacy nodes. Advanced patching actually enables better utilization of all those assets and can breathe new life into these existing resources by giving them a platform where they could actually participate in. Um, and three, advanced patching is, is a lot simpler than advanced fabrication, some of the lithography that Eileen was mentioning. In fact, some estimates that this could be, it, it's typically less than one tenth the cost. And so it, it, it's a, a low cost way for us to get new capability without spending that upfront um, uh, capital expenditure. So advanced patching really changes the focus from making chips and, and changes into assembling chips. And the government should, should think about investing in the development of advanced packaging facilities um, as an innovative approach to reducing our reliance on foreign foundries while providing a platform to better utilize existing domestic fabrication facilities, especially those in the secure and trusted facilities. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, but if we really want to disrupt the semiconductor industry, we really need to start from the basics and look at the fundamental material building blocks. And we see that in, in the 1980s, semiconductor production involved around you know, 11 elements on, on the periodic table. By 2015, uh, semiconductor products involve over half of all elements on the periodic table. Now, these include not just semiconductor materials like silicon, 
but also a variety of gases, metals, and even rare earths, which has been in the news recently. Now, despite the explosion of all these materials that are being used today, over time, the industry itself has grown really around one material, silicon. And the surefire way to disrupt today's semiconductor supply chain is to change the material that the whole industry is based on. This is not as outlandish as you might think, because as it turns out, silicon is, is a rather mediocre semiconductor. There are ones that can operate at higher frequencies than silicon, the ones that can handle much more power, the ones that actually can emit light, uh, are magnetic, and, and uh, various other um, properties that we can exploit. Now, not only would control of these new novel materials exert an outsized influence up and down the supply chain, um, but development would also leverage the U.S. dominant position in semiconductor equipment and tools that Eileen had just mentioned. And so to, to achieve these outcomes, really we think that funding a fundamental research in discovery of these next generation materials that can display silicon is, is of the utmost importance. Uh, but furthermore, building an ecosystem that provides researchers access to commercial grade tools to quickly accelerate that material development process is going to be essential as well. And finally, leveraging these international partnerships to ensure access to material supply chains and, pro and processing capabilities will, will ensure um, our continued access to the various mechanicals and materials that we need in semiconductor production. So, you know, we think uh, of this process as what we call an innovation pipeline. You know, that is, uh, that starts at federal and um, private R&D dollars being put into an idea, then picked up by grants and private investors, followed by the venture capital and large private equity funds. And for many software and internet deals uh, that you know we are all pretty much familiar with, this pipeline is pretty robust, uh, and there are ample private sector investment uh, investments because of the low initial cost, large market, and short time to return on investment for these types of deals. But in commercializing science-based innovation, what we call hard tech, like semiconductors, there is a widening gap in private sector investment because of the high upfront costs and long time it takes for iterating multiple prototypes, uh, in incorporating equipment and for design. Now this gap has left many government funded ideas stranded despite their importance to national security. You know, Incatel sees great opportunities and possibilities and new approaches to promote the commercialization process and address these investment gaps. So one, you know, we think that the government really needs its own investment vehicle to fill the gaps in private equity uh, ecosystem where the technologies are of national importance. And, and second, secondly, we think a microelectronic sandbox, which is a facility that can provide researchers and startups hands-on access to production line uh, equipment that mirrors commercial lines can be that can be adapted to explore new tools and new materials and components and processes greatly accelerate the process of getting ideas from lab to market. And lastly, you know, many researchers who have phenomenal technology don't pursue commercializing those ideas because they lack the entrepreneurial experience, professional networks, or business acumen needed to turn that technology into a viable commercial company. You know, additionally, government-based R&D often engages with the commercial sector way too late and the product development process leading to products that are ill-suited for the commercial sector and, and at a time where it might be too late to pivot. And that is why Incutel, as uh, Steve mentioned, launched Incutel Emerge, which is an, a new effort to support the commercialization uh, government, uh, government funded R&D by sharing our uh, entrepreneurial venture capital and a uh, deep hard tech insight through collaborations with uh, government research organizations like DARPA. Um, and so really inclusion, in conclusion, ensuring U.S. innovation leadership in this sector will not be solved by onshoring uh, supply chain capabilities alone. In fact, we think that the government really needs to engage the broader innovation ecosystem. You know, the same ones that develop the Internet, same ones that help, help send humans to the moon and as of yesterday, and most advanced rover to Mars. You know, that means investing in innovative and disruptive technologies like tools, advanced packaging and materials, but it also means giving the government investment tools itself to address the gaps in commercializing technology that is vital to national security. And, and so with that, we'll, we'll um, you know, thank, thank you guys for, for your attention. I'm 